PM. Uh, can I ask, can people in the back hear me? Affirmatively, thank you very much. Um, can I ask, uh, is this meeting being recorded? I, I, you know, it's kind of, I ask that question every time because I have to, but I know the answer. Um, let me put the public on notice that the meeting is being recorded. Um, can I ask people please to uh, turn their cell phones on silent or shut them off altogether, please? Commission staff included, myself included. Okay, um, look, uh, this is gonna be a long day and uh, there are a lot of people here, I apologize. Um, for those of you that have to stand, uh, just uh, a lot of people here. Um, I wanna first of all start by thanking you for coming today and especially for those of you who signed up to speak. Um, thank you for your willingness to share your experience, concerns and suggestions. Uh, I'm looking forward to a very productive meeting, but before we get started, I just wanna make a few comments about objectives and ground rules for the day. Um, I wanna start by just saying from our inception, we've committed as a commission to try to operate as transparently and responsibly as possible. And while today's session and future forums will have the previously announced round tables will uh, have our examples of this, um, I just wanted to just kind of uh, go through a little bit of history about the way we have listened and changes we've made to our process and regulations up to this point, including social equity program, fee waivers for economic empowerment applicants and social equity program participants, the expediting policy, which uh, produced results uh, in our last meeting of uh, several uh, expedited applicants getting provisional licenses, uh, exclusivity for and pre-certification for social consumption and delivery, and what will be um, um, available hopefully within the next couple of weeks, which is visibility for every applicant into the status of their application. Um, separate from policy, I wanna point out that uh, we had three additional team members join us for the licensing staff um, in the last week, so we continue to try to bulk up that, uh, that part of our operation. Um, so, I mean, the point of that was not to sound defensive, but just to say we are committed to continue listening, learning, and adapting as necessary. So I'm very excited about today's session. Uh, let me just go through a few ground rules to try to make, this, make sure this meeting is as productive and constructive as possible. First, let me just state the obvious. Um, we had um, over 60 people um, sign up to speak. Um, so thank you very much again for those of you uh, that did. Um, I've made the decision that uh, I wanna try to accommodate everybody that did sign up. So what that means is we're gonna limit speakers to three minutes. Um, they uh, um, have three minutes plus if um, any of the commissioners have any follow on questions, uh, we won't count that against the three minutes, but uh, three minutes to, uh, to uh, make your, your comments. Um, please, please uh, respect this limit so that everybody has a chance to speak today. Um, the way we're gonna do this in terms of sequencing, we'll start with speakers that signed up in advance and identified themselves as priority applicants, either uh, economic empowerment or medical uh, dispensaries, uh, followed by those that qualify, identify themselves as qualifying for expediting status. Uh, next, we'll do general applicants and then time permitting, uh, we'll welcome comments from those to, who either didn't sign up in advance or chose not to identify themselves as applicants. The objective today was to make this an applicant forum, so we wanna make sure all the applicants have a chance to speak, but uh, we'll welcome comments from others if we have the time, and I'll do my best to run this meeting as efficiently as possible. Um, for those of you that know me, uh, uh, we are gonna take at least one break, because I don't think I can do four hours without having a break to do what I do. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll run the meeting as efficiently as possible. We do have a, um, a hard stop, however, at 5 p.m. Um, I will do everything I can to accommodate, or try to accommodate all speakers, but uh, if you don't get a chance to speak, we're, we're certainly uh, open and, and, and welcome comments submitted to commission at cccmass.com. Follow up from today's meeting will include two things. One is uh, we will distribute a public, uh, publicly distribute a um, FAQ document on all the topics that were covered today. So those of you that were here, those of you who weren't here can have that summary. Uh, we also, as Commissioner Keitel mentioned at our last meeting, uh, we'll be conducting a series of roundtables on topics that are raised today that require a much more in-depth conversation. And so we'll have some more information about those roundtables shortly. Um, I ask each of you to show respect for the other speakers by uh, not interrupting them, um, not commenting, and uh, uh, preferably no booing, hissing, or cheering. Um, I really, um, really appreciate that. Uh, for the commissioners, we're here to listen and learn. Um, we might ask clarifying questions um, about your testimony, but we won't ask any specific questions about the confidential aspect of any application. Um, and um, apropos of that, uh, we're not here to make decisions. We will not make decisions on individual applications. We will not make decisions on policy or, uh, or uh, processes. We're here really to listen and learn. Um, but the comments and suggestions that we hear today um, will be an important input into our next round of regulatory development, which, which will start um, sometime in February. It'll be a topic at our next 
public meeting on February 6th, and this timing is great. We will listen, we will learn, and this, what we learn today will be an important part of uh, our regulatory development uh, in the next few months. Um, uh, to the extent that uh, questions come up about an individual application, um, again, we're not going to comment on, on that today or, or make decisions on that, but we do have staff here that are taking notes and we will follow up individually um, on, uh, on individual license questions that come up. Um, the staff here um, is here to listen, learn, take notes. They're not here to answer questions. And then uh, let me just find, close by making just a few requests. Um, this is a public meeting. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to learn from your experience. Um, and hear about complaints or concerns, but to make this as constructive and as uh, productive as possible, suggestions are incredibly well welcome. Um, we really want to hear your perspective on how you think things can improve so we can take those under consideration as we develop new regulations and new processes. And in that uh, um, construct, uh, the more that those suggestions focus on things that the Commission actually can do, and that is change our regulations, change our licensing process, the more productive it's going to be um, to the extent that concerns and questions and suggestions come up around things like host community agreements, zoning, uh, a loan fund that the state would uh, create. Those are things that have to be accomplished legislatively. We're certainly, you know, it's a public meeting. You're welcome to say whatever you want to. But again, the more you can focus on things that we can actually do um, at the commission, which is our regulations and our processes, the more constructive and productive it'll be. Um, thank you uh, very much for listening. Uh, let's get started. What I'm going to do is call out names. Um, if your name is called, um, please come up, uh, sit at the chair. Uh, we've learned that you need to be no more than two inches away from these microphones to be heard, so I'd appreciate it if you would ensure that you were uh, close to the microphone. Uh, state your name and uh, get going. Uh, we do have a timekeeper over there. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, she'll give you a heads up when you've got 30 seconds left. But I really, really would appreciate people adhering to the three-minute limitation just to give everybody a chance to speak. So thank you. Um, let's get going. Uh, any uh, comments or, uh, from the other commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Title? And, oh, by the way, Lucas, thank you for the apple. Um, just real quick. So, um, yeah, so I'm here with the primary purpose of learning what we can do with our process that we have control over. So you can talk about whatever you want, but that's the part that I'm most interested in. Also, sometimes when I talk to applicants, they think that I know everything about their application, and I usually don't. I know what's in our regulations, and then I know um, what comes in front of us as a meeting. I don't generally know what's going on in between. So the more you can give context and your personal experience, the more helpful that will be. Great. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, uh, then let's get going. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Jordan Clark. And I, I guess, let me just apologize ahead of time if I mangle anybody's name. I'll do the best I can. Uh, Jordan Clark. Please come up then, and introduce yourself. And again, please uh, make sure you're pretty close to the microphone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jonathan Spencer. I'm an AE applicant in the city of Boston. And um, didn't expect to speak so early. However, well, you, got, you signed up early. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Obviously, uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's a, uh, we definitely need more time. Obviously, there's, there's, you know, hundreds of people here that need to speak. And that there are some that, um, aren't able to make it here. But um, I'll speak to my particular situation. <sighs> uh, being the second um, economic empowerment applicant and the first to uh, put an application in the city of Boston, I've yet to receive an HCA. And my personal opinion about that is that, um, that there's a lot of forces that are, are um, in the way of, of my personal progress and the progress of others in this uh, industry. People like myself who have been affected by the war on drugs, I don't mean lived in an area where there were um, arrest and lowered my property value. Can you move the mic closer? Sorry. I don't mean um, Great, thank you. that I lived in an area where there were, were drug arrest. I mean, I was personally affected by the war on drugs. And um, this happened over a course of, of uh, many years. Um, I've been incarcerated. Uh, I've, I've been attacked by by police officers. 
um, who are now currently testifying against one another um, in federal courthouse right now. Um, it, it, you know, we've all been devastated by this, and now we're put in a position where we have to somehow compete with large corporations um, or uh, multi-state operators to uh, uh, get establishments in this competitive uh, environment. It, it's uh, totally unfair. And so um, we need the commission to uh, be aware that, that the regulations that, that you passed down are affecting us um, personally. It's making our businesses um, uh, uh, unable to compete with these, uh, these large corporations because you know, they're like a, a, a massive um, you know, uh, flood you know, passing through a, a, a dam. You know, you just like, you know, you, you guys are trying to poke holes. In, uh, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the water's poking, pushing through the, 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 the dike and you guys are trying to plug it up here and there and there and there. But what you need to do is possibly lower the, uh, um, the qualifications for these, these licenses, make it a little bit easier for smaller businesses to come in into this space or, or um, individuals to come into this space and uh, operate. Um, and, uh, and, and so um, largely I just want, oh, for the most part, I just wanted to say that, that we need smaller scale licenses, more of them. Not the, these uh, uh, dispensaries that are that are, you know that uh, seem to be dominating the uh, the the attention span of everybody in this space right now, um, and uh, essentially um, that, that's it for right now. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, because everybody just got to do as good as po job as possible. Like I said these things you need to be no more than two inches away. Sorry, uh, question. When you say uh, lower the qualifications, could you be more specific? Um, well, it, the qualifications uh, seem to be uh, requiring um, these HCAs for one. The H I know you can't do anything about the HCAs. I, I, I totally understand that. However, um, there are these delivery licenses that need to happen uh, as soon as possible. They're, they're causing a problem um, for, they're, they're creating, a, it's that requiring us to have a, um, a, a, to get a dispensary being the only avenue for us to get in is is just it's a, it's a problem, you know because we're again like I said we're we're competing with large corporations who are um, uh, reinventing themselves based upon the regulations that you guys make, you know like you guys um, essentially you you guys are uh, uh, you know may have um, created a larger um, hurdle for them to jump through, but they are now reforming themselves and coming in in different in different ways. Um, by by partnering with economic empowerment applicants, uh, quote unquote, partnering with them, but in in, in reality, is they're just you know turning them to fronts, and then they are competing with us again. You know, they might not be, you might not be the uh, large corporation um, that you once saw them. They are now coming in and buying up essentially economic empowerment applicants, and now they're competing with us in this space. So there is, it's going to be uh, essentially it's impossible for us to get dispensaries or um, facilities. You know the, the the municipalities they're not going to allow us to get HCAs. They haven't. You know, and, and the, our largest problem, our biggest problem with this, was that um, when you had the the protest here, the biggest problem was that we see we see that the the industry is being built right in front of our face. You know, and it looks like it's a bunch of white men who are building this industry directly in front of us, and we have to stop that because if we don't stop that, then you know, we're going to be looking back in five years and, and saying, you know, um, look what they did. We, we warned them, you know, but um, the question was about the lowering the barriers. So uh, lowering the barriers, that would be the, that the, the, the smaller, the, um, smaller scale licenses like a uh, delivery license would be. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right, thank you. Uh, next speaker is Michael O'Tulip. So uh, we have uh, we have a process suggestion from uh, Commissioner Doyle, which I think, as always, is a good one. So uh, I'm going to announce I'm going to ask for uh, the speaker that's currently up, and then I'm also going to uh, say who's up next, just so that uh, you can prepare. So Michael Tulip is not here. Um, we'll, I'll come back and uh, give him a chance later on in case he's late. But um, next speaker is Jessica uh, Pelletier, and after her will be Francis Burns. Good afternoon.
Good afternoon. Um, Michael's walking upstairs right now, so he can go right after me. Okay, are you you're sure you're Jessica? Yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll have Michael right after you. And okay. then, uh, then Francis Burns afterwards. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm Jessica Pelletier. I'm CEO of Advance on Massachusetts, EE number 202228. I just wanted to touch on a few points regarding obtaining investment for EE applicants. Um, right now, there currently exists no guidance. <coughs> Excuse me provided by the commission regarding financial investors and starting capital. The cost of opening a facility is extremely high and cannabis businesses cannot obtain loans from traditional financial institutions. Uh, those of us who don't have billions of dollars will have to seek investment from investors <coughs> or other cannabis or non-cannabis companies. There should be guidance issued on acceptable investment in equity terms, loan structures, and or any other <coughs> acceptable means for economic empowerment applicants to be attractive for investors in their respective companies. Furthermore, nobody has defined what ownership is for economic empowerment, how much equity, if any, are we able to sell to raise money um, and not trigger any ownership or control issues. Thank you very much. Okay, thank any you. Any questions for Jessica? Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Michael Church. So Michael uh, Latulip and then uh, Francis Burns will be next. Thank you, Jessica. Thank Good afternoon, Michael. How are you? Good, that's good. How are you guys doing? Good. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, I know, right? It's been a while. Leave me alone. What's going on? <laughs> New office. Everything looks good. Everything's doing well, actually. Um, good. Very happy you guys are doing this. Thank you guys very much. Um, there's three points that I'm going to make today um, about the application process for economic empowerment applicants. I am an economic empowerment applicant. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm right. You here when I, uh, you got to be within an inch of the mic. So um, as part of kind of the municipal process lately, we've been encountering um, that there's really only one name listed often on the economic empowerment application number. So when they see the list of names, they don't necessarily see all the qualifying individuals on a given application. Um, the licensing staff has said that each individual can apply for that to be sent to them in an email form. So if they're if they're not necessarily listed, they can still get what they would like. But I think maybe um, if you guys just provided that to everyone um, who currently qualifies as an individual on an, an economic empowerment application, um, it would be very helpful um, to, to us at the municipal level, especially in these towns that are um, they're kind of looking for clarity as to who exactly qualifies on a given economic empowerment application. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you just clarify, provide a... Yeah, essentially there's a, a, some sort of notice or certification email or something that would sh show that this individual is on this particular economic empowerment application. That would be great because then we can essentially pass it on to the municipal official and say, this person you can see d did qualify on this given economic empowerment application. Um, I would also say that in terms of the... When, we, when an economic empowerment applicant submits to the commission, it would be really great if a, a member of the licensing staff would kind of take that application on and maybe keep following that individual application, um, maybe put their name to it as well so the EE applicant kind of knows who they're interacting with and then that particular person stays on throughout the entire um, process. That way there's some accountability, uh, the staff can take pride in this particular applicant um, you know, that they helped them and kind of got them through the process. Um, and that way also the RFIs aren't necessarily competing if there's two different people working on a particular application or um, something like that. I had to run here, so sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, and then the third thing, um, the third thing I would say is um, we some guidance on how we should obtain investment and not trigger the loss of yep. EE status is something that would be very, very helpful. I don't know if that could be in an FAQ or just a guidance document of some sort. I think that would be very helpful to all the economic empowerment efforts because we essentially don't have traditional bank loans. And you know, if we did, I'm sure the interest rates would be insane right now. Uh, so you know, certainly, I think that's that's the way to go. So with that, I will end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Any questions for Michael? Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, so the next speaker, as I mentioned, is uh, Francis Burns, and uh, following Francis will be Averill and Andrade. Do you have Francis?
we'll, uh, we'll I'll come I'll come back over with everybody that uh, that signed up but uh, didn't answer. Um, Averill Andrade. Um, he's here. Averill Andrade, and then the, the following speaker will be Marcus Williams. Good afternoon. Uh, again, uh, if you could uh, hunch over and be an inch or less away from the microphone, I think the people in the back would appreciate it, as well as the commissioners. All right. I'm pretty loud, so I'm confident in that. Uh, first, I would like to thank the commission for providing us the opportunity to discuss the struggles many of us economic empowerment applicants are facing. The first issue I believe is plaguing the queue is the ability for an organization that has not served a single patient to use their medicinal priority to open a recreational facility anywhere in the state. The med medicinal priority should only be granted to establish medicinal facilities that are currently serving patients, and that priority should only be extended to convert that current location in a way that will not disrupt the access to their medicinal patients. The CCC needs to immediately implement a one-on-one -on -one ratio of prioritized applicants to general applicants. This process can be implemented by not only hiring more reviewers to go through the applications, but also to establish a system of agents. These agents can review the applicant's entire application, and by applicant I mean the EE and prioritized applicants, entire application, compile a completed list of information that's needed or where clarification is needed, and have a face-to-face -face meeting with that applicant to make a defined plan on how to help complete the application in a timely manner on both ends. We are not just numbers on papers, we are real, actual people. The CCC also needs to acquire these agents to help these EE applicants who are not yet in the queue and help bridge the gaps to get them into the queue. There are so many other things that I can go on and on about, uh, but there is one more important thing I would like the commission to hear today. Please hold these public meetings on the south coast. Almost 20% of the communities deemed disproportionately impacted are south of Brockton. We greatly appreciate the one time that this commission came to the south coast and held a listening session in Dartmouth. Many people on the South Coast and Cape cannot make it all the way out to Boston and Worcester. We need help and we need to be heard. And we have that right and we need to be served in our communities also. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Again, please, uh, any questions before you, any questions? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, next speaker is uh, Marcus Williams and following Marcus will be Trevor Barnes. Marcus? Again, I'll, I'll come back and give everybody a chance just in case they're, they're late. Um, so, M Marcus, Trevor, neither? Um, Marcus, welcome. That's fine. Uh, if just again, if you wouldn't mind, just make sure that you're very close to the microphone so people in the back can hear you. Is this good? Uh, ask that, uh, is that good? That's yep, good. you got the thumbs up. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you to the Cannabis Control Commission for having this meeting. My name is Marcus Williams, and I am one of the partners of Community Growth Partners. We are an economic empowerment establishment that received provisional licensing this past November. <coughs> we will be opening a retail store in Great Barrington under the name Rebel, and we are also building a cultivation <coughs> and product manufacturing facility in Northampton. I myself am from Dorchester, born and raised. I've spent probably 95% of my 35 years there. It's where I met my wife, where I bought my house, where I raised my two children, and hopefully in the future, fingers crossed, where I will open an additional establishment. I am particularly passionate about the genetics of the cannabis plant and the product development aspect of the cannabis market. I've been creating new cultivars in seed form for a long time, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to potentially bring some of those to market here in Massachusetts. I wanted to speak to the commission today about my experience with the licensing process, the climate around licensing, and the purpose behind the economic empowerment and social equity statutes, as well as offer a suggestion to the commission on how to potentially improve that climate. With that said, I've had to truncate my words significantly since I just learned that I only have three minutes, not five. I will do my best to keep my comments brief and use only the allotted time while still getting my point across. When you consider the harsh reality of the current licensing environment, it's hard to think that an EEC or social equity applicant is expected to compete on such an unlevel playing field. Leveling that playing field was supposed to be the purpose behind these economic empowerment and social equity statutes to begin with. It's one thing to grant a license or a means to obtain a license. It's a completely different thing for a business to survive. 
We need to make sure that the environment around licensing is healthy enough for EE and social equity businesses to survive. Lack of access to capital is a massive problem and hindrance in this regard. And this is where I cut out three paragraphs, so let's just skip ahead. Sorry about that, thank With you. With that said, I understand that you all are commissioners and not legislators, so there's only so much that can be done by the commission. I would ask that the commission please consider another public meeting similar to this one where applicants can discuss not just licensing recommendations, but the financial implications behind licensing in more detail. I challenge the commission to get together with the state legislature, perhaps the cannabis advi advisory board members to start and put a public meeting to discuss, to discuss cannabis financing on your calendar in the very near future. So in the interest of time, let me skip right to my suggestion to the commission. I believe this suggestion is within the power and the authority of the commission to implement. If it's not, then it should be. I propose that the commission create a real estate waiver. The purpose of this waiver is to facilitate the licensing process and ease the immediate financial burden on EEC and social equity applicants. This special waiver would be created by the commission and granted to EEC and social equity applicants to waive the upfront requirements for real estate prior to provisional licensing with the stipulation that the real estate requirements of the application will be fulfilled within a realistic time frame after the granting of provisional licensing and obviously before final licensing. Basically, for EEC applicants, make real estate a requirement further down the line in the licensing process. This will definitely remove one of the initial upfront barriers if you're an EEC applicant. It's not the ultimate solution, but I believe it can be done and will undoubtedly help. We can see this type of common sense approach being implemented today in Illinois, where you have 180 days, six months, from the moment you're granted a conditional license to get your real estate in order. Marcus, I know you've cut it down, but you need, your time is up, so please conclude, if you could. I'll wrap this up by saying thank you again to the commission for hearing my thoughts on this issue. Thank, thank you, Marcus, appreciate it. Yes, go ahead, uh, uh, guys. I, I appreciate. Go ahead, uh, Commissioner Flanagan. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, uh, it is uh, commission at ccmass.com. Is that correct? Um, I'll just follow up. Same please thing. do. Please do. Thank, Thank you very much. much. I appreciate those comments, Commissioner Title. Yes. If you could stay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Marcus. Um, we, three minutes plus time for questions. Yes. 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 yes, yes. Questions slash follow up. Yes. Um, I think you're absolutely right that it's time to revisit um, the investment question and the grants question. Um, it's been a long time since um, Sonia Ch Chang Diaz's bill was first introduced. And since then, Illinois has developed a grant program, so there's now a model. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, and I can commit to looking into that for you um, to have another meeting on that subject and to talk to legislators. If, if I may say thank you, Commissioner, I, I appreciate you highlighting that. I was going to highlight that uh, budget amendment by the Senator uh, as a part of this speech. I was also going to suggest possible uh, tax breaks, you know, uh, to incentivize specifically real, uh, retail only EEC applicants due to uh, the tremendous 280E burdens that are placed on retail only. Uh, yeah, and you know, we definitely need to have another meeting to talk financing. So I, I appreciate your, your concern in that regard. And Thank then you. secondly, in terms of the real estate waiver, um, we didn't call it that, but that's very similar to the pre-certification that we're developing in which a social equity program participant could initially um, get a pre-certification and leave the property HCA and documentation of capital to the end. Mm. Um, so that, that is in our current regulations. It has, it's being implemented. Um, I think it's very similar to what you just suggested. Awesome, I love hearing that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, appreciate uh, your comments. Um, next speaker is uh, Trevor Barnes and following Trevor will be Dr. Uma. Is Trevor here? Do we have Trevor? Okay, well, I'll, I'll come back again. Give me a chance. Give me a chance. Uh, Dr. Uma, are you here? Yeah, yeah. I just decided I wasn't going <laughs> to take a risk there. Okay. Uh, next speaker is uh, Michael Ortol. And following Michael will be uh, Zakia Awaki. Um, is uh, is Michael here? Okay, Zakia? Okay. Uh, Caroline Cano will be after you. Good afternoon, Michael. Good afternoon, commissioners. <coughs> Good afternoon. 
So I'll make this uh, brief. Um, so uh, HCA's obviously been an issue for us uh, getting there. Uh, this barrier obviously needs to be redirected for priority uh, applicants. Another one is uh, we discussed about a year ago about having uh, like a pre-approval, um, like some kind of form that we could also show our investors. Um, that's something that <coughs> I haven't seen come to fruition that hopefully we can see in the near future. Um, and that's all I have to say today. Thank you very much. Any questions? Commissioner Tyrell? Sorry, just to quickly repeat myself from the last one. So it's we called it pre-certification, and it is in the current regulations. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Zakia, has we found Zakia Locky. Yeah, I'll come back for her. Then the uh, next speaker. Next speaker uh, would be Caroline Pinot. Car excuse me, Caroline Pinot. Be here, and then uh, after Caroline. Uh, Omanu Garner. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Caroline Pino. I'm an economic empowerment applicant opening a retail establishment, Haverhill STEM LLC in Haverhill, Massachusetts. I appreciate the opportunity to share my experience with my application process and my pursuit of a retail license here in Massachusetts. This is a new endeavor for operators and commission alike. A little more visibility into what is expected of operators at each phase would go a long way towards alleviating anxiety and minimizing costly mistakes on behalf of the operator. This could also save the commission time throughout the approval process. <coughs> Many of my project delays and setbacks were due to Bless challenges you. on the municipal level, including navigating local politics and a few zoning postponements. As an economic empowerment applicant, I received communication early on in my process from Shakia Scott, Director of Community Outreach, who was looking to learn more about how she can support my process. Aside from being notified of events, however, I felt that that communication from that point on was very general in nature. What could have helped my process in a significant manner was more one-on-one -on -one support and access. Over time, I ran into logistical roadblocks or generic guidance questions with my application. As a mom and pop operator, I have worked tirelessly to navigate the application process on my own without the help of a law firm. There is nothing more frustrating when you have a fairly straightforward question calling the commission and not being able to connect with a live person. I recognize that everyone is very busy, but I would have found it very helpful for there to be a direct line to an economic empowerment outreach person that could field questions and follow up with answers. I will say that the frustration of not being able to always get the answer has in effect connected me to the Canvas business community in a very positive way which for the most part I have fa found to be incredibly supportive, generous, and willing to share business experience and best practice. Companies like Garden Remedies, Revolutionary Clinics, and Caroline's Cannabis have gone above and beyond to offer me mentorship, guidance, and compliance support. During my application process, I received three requests for more information, which from what I hear is not uncommon. The frustrating part for me as someone who was attentive and expeditious in my responses to each RFI was that a different CCC licensing representative was reviewing my application each time. Each subsequent RFI request had nothing to do with the prior, so it was either missed by the first reviewer or left up to the interpretation of whomever was reviewing it. And although I made it through the RFI process in a couple of months, those precious couple of months could have been avoided by having a consistent set of eyes looking at my application each time. 30 seconds, Caroline. Please. If there is any way to streamline that process, I think it would help to speed up um, the application process. Time is precious. I've made a sizable investment in the business, which puts me in a precarious position. Because the expectations by the CCC are somewhat ambiguous, I'm not sure if money has been sent in the proper areas and will only find this out once I get my provisional inspection. With that inspection on the horizon, I remain optimistic but nervous based on my experience with the application review process at the relative unknowns of the inspection process. Mm -hmm. With once per month cadence of CCC meetings, it's difficult to fathom the possibility of having to wait another whole month before coming before the commission for my license in the, in the event of any potential deficiencies. Despite the inspection department being a tremendous resource via telephone the past few months, it would be helpful to have someone that could have come out to my site prior to the full inspection. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Any questions? Uh, please, any questions? Um, do you remember what the fairly straightforward question was that you referred to? Um, okay, there were um, several um, 
uh, at one point during the application process, there was a delay, um, which I ultimately got answered, uh, you know, a, a few weeks later. But where the um, uh, the actual the licensing component fee was supposed to be decreased, and it was it was still I, w I was getting paused in the online portal because it was still charging the ten thousand dollar fee when it should have been the five thousand dollar fee. Um, but then that alone took three more weeks to get that just a simple thing administrative thing resolved. Um, and there were a few other ones that I can certainly follow up with you. Um, in writing and, and let you know what those were, but um, just fairly straightforward administrative things that didn't really require um, the advice of, of, of legal counsel, but I had to, s to seek answers elsewhere, um, but I could have hopefully have in the future, the, the commission can offer those answers directly to applicants. Thanks. Thanks very much, Caroline. Um, next speaker is Omanique Garner. They're on their way, so I'll, I'll come back to them, okay? Uh, uh, Enid Pope. And after Enid will be uh, Nathan Andrade. Uh, Enid, Enid is here. Uh, afternoon, Enid. How are you? Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I just want to start off by trying to get straight to the Could point because oh, I, I'm trying to get straight to the point because um, there are a lot of things that I could talk about. I could talk about my background. But um, I don't like talking about it. Um, <laughs> the other thing is that I'm afraid that it might sound like entitlement. I feel like once I was vetted and approved as an economic empowerment applicant, that's all the qualifications that were needed. Yeah. It's very disappointing for me to hear people speak today, and they talk about things that I never received. I never got communication on a number of things. I had no idea that you guys you talked about the pre-qualification, but I never received notification of it. The way I find out things is by coming to the hearings. And I gotta tell you, Worcester ain't bad, but it is quite a commute from, from Boston. In addition to that, as I'm getting to know my community and I'm forming community, which takes a lot of time, an effort to build trust. I'm learning that there are so many people who have had a head start. I moved to Boston in July 2016. My life changed in so many ways on November 2016. Good, bad, ugly, I was tested, and it's a test of my will because I do know that what's going to happen with cannabis is going to be so important. And I've been very cautious when it comes to lawyers and lobbyists. Mm -hmm. I lived in D.C. I became an adult in Washington, D.C., so I know lobbyists. I've worked with them. Lawyers, my dad is a graduate of Howard University Law School, and God rest his soul, he would want me to be extremely cautious. And in addition to that, when he built his commercial building, it was in a bad neighborhood. That neighborhood stayed suppressed. It was a commercial space that was designed by Harvey Gant, who was a black architect. We tried to create an example in our community. And financially, we were impacted. I went to school in that neighborhood so I could talk about people who were locked up. I have friends whose mothers they're single moms on drugs, and they still manage to give scholarships to college. So when we talk about what's happening, you have to prioritize economic empowerment because I never felt like a priority. You need to go for a second. Okay. I'm done. Thank you very much. You're are, welcome. Are there questions before you? Are there any questions for Enid? Okay. Thank you very much, Enid. You're welcome. Uh, next speaker is uh, Nathan Andrade, and after Nathan uh, will be uh, Chief Samora. Nathan, good afternoon. How are you? Between the rules. Today I'm here to do what I always have done, support local businesses. Like our friend Andrew Muddy says, where are the small businesses? Where is River Run Gardens license? Where is Beantown Greentown's license? Where is Deep Roots license? I admire how these small businesses and many other businesses that have somehow managed to maneuver through this onerous and unfair process. It's clear to most of us that our state representatives in the CCC favor big corporate cannabis over small local businesses. 
but the, pri but the prioritization for medical dispensaries needs to be changed. Only medical facilities that are already serving patients should get priority. And that priority should only extend to the current medis medicinal location in a manner that does not disrupt patients' access to medicine. I understand trying to slow down or halt this process will only hurt the, the ones we respect the most. But the state and the CCC needs to think about economic empowerment reform or some sort. 22 out of 122 EE applicants have made it into the queue. That means only 18% of the first group given priority have reached this milestone, and that is unacceptable. This, the remaining 82% of EE approved applicants represents the group that is still being disproportionately affected and not heard. A minimum of one to one ratio needs to be implemented immediately with no grandfathering clauses, allowing prioritized applicants a chance to enter into this industry. For every general applicant approved, there must be a prioritized applicant approval. The industry should be comprised of equal number of general applicant establishments to prioritize applicant establishments. And while I could go on for hours with problems applicants are having before even entering the queue from municipalities, zoning, prohibitive prohib prohib attitudes, law enforcement, corruption through the ACA process in towns and cities that have been deemed disproportionately impacted, not developing pathways for EE and SE applicants. I want to leave the time for my fellow community members to speak. Thank you for hearing Thank me. Thank you very much, Nathan. Are there questions? Thank you very much, Nathan. I appreciate it. Uh, next speaker is uh, uh, Chief Samara, um, and then following uh, Chief will be uh, Cynthia Mornpoint. Is Chief here? Good afternoon, Chief. How are you? Well, thanks. I, w I hope that I could hear more about uh, what, what else was going on here, but um, I'm just here to uh, just say a few things. I appreciate the opportunity. It's good to see you all here. Um, uh, I'm an economic empowerment applicant, of course, and I just wanted to bring uh, a few things to your attention. Um, if you're familiar with Malcolm Gladwell, he's the author of The Tipping Point. He says it only takes 5% of a community to serve as role models to stabilize and then change that culture. So it takes very little to change a business culture for the good. We just need those parameters. And so we're asking you to help us, right, change these factors to increase this, these parameters. Um, there's no equity fund, right? There's no equity fund. 420 million last year and still no fund. One of the things that's been confusing to me is why we seem to be wasting so much time and years now uh, pursuing politicians. Some of them may be prohibitionists and asking them to create a fund. I think that's been a, um, kind of a waste of time when we can simply just encourage direct support from within the industry in the positive impact plans. And um, it's been confusing to me. I've, I see the new guidance on the positive impact plans, I think that's a, a little progress. I think it would have been better to focus on that direct support to EEs and SEs in the positive impact plans earlier. Um, so very simple ways to do that. Another way, and I've already written to the commission several times about this, I've conf I'm confused why I haven't responded on this one either, is I made a, a request under the Massachusetts General Laws Part One, Title Three. Chapter, chapter 30A, Section 4, is for petitions for adoption of amendment and repeal of regulations. And Section 4 says, any interested person may petition an agency requesting the adoption, amendment, or repeal of any regulation and may accompany his petition with such data, views, and arguments as he thinks pertinent. And so I've already made one of these requests for um, uh, 935 CMR 500.040. 3A1, where it talks about the leadership ratings um, for marijuana establishments and the leadership rating criteria. It's very simply, um, a, a, a small change to this um, would allow 1% um, of marijuana establishments gross to go straight to social equity and economic empowerment applicants as well. There is no fund. 30 seconds, please. There is no, Thank so you, Chief. I don't understand. We're all here to encourage 
activity in the market and licensees to work together. And I think the newer, latest guidance is try working closer to get us there. But um, I, I really want to just suggest, yes, now, is it now it's time. I mean, to require um, more EEs and SEs to be in these positive impact grants as they're coming through. And I think the way that it's all set up, it's very clear that's kind of the most effective way this whole thing has been designed. So I'd like to see more of that, and, and I want to encourage you all to continue to create um, the environment to encourage us all to do business together. Thank you, Chief. Questions? Uh, yes, Commissioner Can Flanagan. you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by direct support through the positive impact plan, considering every business has to have one? Absolutely. So the positive impact plans are to have a positive impact on disproportionately harmed communities. And of course, economic empowerment applicants and social equity applicants are one of the main engines for doing this change. So it's natural to me to see um, people who are putting together, businesses putting together the positive impact plans to encourage, encourage having EEs and SEs right in those plans explaining how they're working with them, how they're providing support to them with grants or whether it's um, training or what, whatever the positive relationship is there. 420 million last year, you know, went through all these licensees. EEs and SEs weren't part of that. You see what I mean? And so uh, we can fix this very quickly by just making sure that there's more people working together and that the environment is more welcoming for EEs and SEs like that. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you, Pam. Uh, Commissioner Title. Um, Commissioner Title. I, I completely agree with what um, you just said about the direct support, and I think it's very similar to the thought process that we went through because I think it would have made sense to have that fund first. Um, it was modeled on a line in the law um, in terms of technical assistance, and then for this is probably like the biggest bureaucratic barrier I've ever run into. We don't have the ability to create a fund. And we have checks being written from our licensees, presumably for this fund, that are just being held in escrow. Um, and there is a bill pending that would allow us to create that fund, but we're all in the same position. So in the meantime, I agree with you. It makes a lot of sense to encourage direct support into social equity program participants and economic empowerment applicants. Um, I actually don't think we could be any more clear about that because our guidance makes that very clear. Um, it was released at our last meeting, and at our last meeting, um, we approved a positive impact plan where essentially the entire positive impact plan was that they were going to help one social equity and one economic empowerment applicant get off the ground. Right. Um, there was also a speaker before you that noted that there were different companies that were mentoring her, and I think that's part of their plans as well. So I don't know how to be any clearer, but I'll repeat it right now. It's yep. a great way to have a positive impact. Yep. I think just in the social leadership um, language there, there's, a, there's an opportunity because it's encouraging companies to pay into a fund that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So we can very quickly address that, that there and let that money go straight to where it's supposed to go, to the EEs and SEs, so we can kickstart this industry the way I think it was designed. And so I think right there in that small piece of text, and, and I'll send – what I have to you again, I think you can change it very quickly and encourage some more of this activity by instead of encouraging companies to pay into a fund that doesn't exist yet, encourage them to, to start these relationships with EEs and SEs and directly support them. Thank you, Chief. Uh, or potentially they could create their own fund or one party could create their own yes, fund. Yes, exactly. And I think, yeah, it. and make it so nonprofits could run these funds. I mean, I, I was talking to some of these cities and towns, they want to create this stuff. We need the environment. If you change that text there, it would allow for nonprofits to run a fund. We wouldn't have to wait for politicians to vote on it or anything like that. So okay. thank you. Any Thanks, Chief. Any other questions? Thanks. Thank you. Um, so next speaker is uh, Cynthia Monpoint, and the speaker after that will be Jillian uh, Williamson. So uh, Cynthia. Uh, we'll come back. What's your name? Yeah, um, so why don't you come on up, if that's okay. I'm Nick Garner. Great. Good afternoon. Uh, you need to be about an inch away from the microphone so that people can hear you. Okay. Thank you. So one thing, I'm really, really nervous. Um, Please don't be. <laughs> Um, so my name is Omni Garner. We are Economic Empowerment Certificate people. Um, we are the only black co-op um, farmers at our price. And I am basically here just like 
bring it back and like we need to really think about what is equity and the recreational cannabis injury was industry was supposed to be created to create equity for people that are you know directly and indirectly affected by this and if you know black and brown people are not moving forward if eus are not moving forward then we really need to pause and reevaluate the system um we really need support municipalities have too much control um and we don't really have any like any support from you guys when we're dealing with these municipalities when it came to the situation with Washington there wasn't really much support <laughs> when we show you what we as EEs wanted to push forward no one really came back in us I'm struggling as a black farmer we have land we have land for over a hundred years in Rochester and yet they're telling us like we need we need to have our investor in order to to start up in Rochester in order to get things going I think one thing you guys could do is provide provisionary licenses to economic empowerment people and maybe a liaison or someone to come and literally sit down if we could actually I think it's embarrassing and it makes me I'm really anxious right now I'm sweating so imagine someone that's really been you know you know someone that was locked up coming in here and with this setting with all these white white men white women and how would they feel I'm sorry I'm like um, so if you guys could sit and come to talk to us EEs, individual businesses, and support us as we're trying to deal with these municipalities, that would be so helpful. And we can literally tell you the one-on-one -on -one barriers and step-by-step -step what we've been doing and how they're answering back to us. We're, we're not even, Rochester's not even communicating with us right now. Um, they're not showing their bylaws. There's, the bylaws aren't on anything online. We're reaching out to them by email. We're calling them. Um, maybe one of you guys could reach out and then get that to us in that way. But I think maybe the provisionary license would be really, really helpful. Also, what, is, what does priority mean? Does it mean anything? Like we get priority review for economic empowerment, but only 15 EEs are through, applications are through. If we're talking about equity, you guys need to provide those services, that technical assistance. We need help creating business plans. We need to be in this industry. People that use this plant, use this plant. I've been using this plant since I was 15. Mm -hmm. You know, I know plenty of people selling this plant to survive, single parents. So I'm just like, how do we support those people and make sure these people are the people that are running the recreational industry, not Big Canna? Okay. Thank you, Omonique. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, th thank you yeah, for your. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner from Title. Um, it's brave of you to do that when you're anxious, and it's, I appreciate your vulnerability in, in saying that. Thank you. Um, I want to plug again something that I plugged at our last meeting, which is our guidance on licensing. Um, a couple of people have said that um, they fell out of the loop, so I want to make sure you know about this document. Um, Commissioner McBride called it a manual. I called it an equalizer. It's a really, really important document. It's 50 pages long. Um, it's in the public meeting packet from our last meeting. And it goes through all the different types of licenses, it goes through the process, and it goes through the pre-certification, which a lot of people have brought up um, in different ways, which leaves the municipal process to the end mm -hmm. for certain applicants. Um, I also appreciate um, the need for guidance and technical assistance. I think that's something that we need to talk through on our end because, and maybe this is one of the things that will be worked out in roundtables, because it's difficult for us to help some applicants in one way and not help other applicants in that same way. Um, I think it's possible, but it, it's something that we need to talk through. Thank you. Can, do I, can I comment back? Sure, go ahead. Um, I just want to say one thing is a struggle, like I'm dyslexic. I, um, I tried applying for the social equity program. Um, there was a little struggle because of the back paperwork that you guys needed between like having like a bill or a bank account and your name for this long and my bank accounts got shut down and all that shit. Point is I reached out, I know we can't say Pacific, so I reached out to a counselor to get help on that, explaining that I'm dyslexic, I went through this process, bank accounts closed, dealing with housing instability. And they responded and sent me the link and said, read the information. I'm dyslexic. How are you guys meeting people where they're at? If someone doesn't have an internet connection, how are you meeting that person at a library so they can apply for social equity? I need someone to help me do that. And I know people that are coming out of the system need someone to help them do that. So if we're talking about equity, how are we meeting people where they're at? People that use this plant, make creams, make medicine out of it, and survive off this plant. 
how do we allow them to like really, you know, navigate it? So I get what you're saying, but like how do we really push? And it's frustrating when we reach out to someone and they kind of just brush us off with a little link when you explain about your disability and how you read the link and it still doesn't qualify for you. So it's not just a checkbox. Sometimes we have to go outside that checkbox and how are you gonna come meet me where I'm at? Are you gonna meet me in Dorchester? Are you gonna meet me in Mattapan? I'm here now, but it's like, I don't know, it's okay. a lot. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, next, next speaker is uh, Cynthia Monpoint. Is she here? And then the speaker after that is Jillian Williamson. Do we have Cynthia? And then the uh, next speaker, as I said, is Jillian Williamson. Cynthia? Yes. Please ha have a seat. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Um, uh, just since you might have been unable to hear, so it, you need to be about an inch away from the microphone so the people in uh, the back can hear you, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you very much. Taking this. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cynthia Monpoint. I'm with the Dombala Group, Economic Empowerment Certified Applicant here in Massachusetts. And first issue that uh, I wanted to bring up with you is the issue of funding. Particularly, I started my uh, project last year pursuing my establishment, and I had an investor, she was working with me, and she was told by uh, one of your certified vendors that it was illegal for her to invest in my project. And so I'd like clarity as to how, is, how it is, if we can have investors, and to what extent and in what capacity, and if there's a limit as to the number of investors that we can have for our establishment. So that's my first question. Secondly, I'd like to take an opportunity through this forum, which thank you for uh, hosting, through this forum to address some of the issues that I've seen through this, through this process. And the, one of the biggest ones that I have is the lack of communication. As an economic empowerment applicant, I've been looking to the CCC for the guidance as to what it is that will be done moving forward. And at the onset, I received a communication uh, from uh, your staff members. It was trickled down, but from then moving forward, there was no longer any communication. You have a platform on that you established on your website that allows for companies, vendors, individuals who would like to partner with people who are promoting economic uh, empowerment, helping out the, the communities that you identified as disproportionately impacted, and the individuals who are impacted the most by this, uh, by the war on weed, the war on black and brown communities. And that platform, I think you call it the, um, the social equity forum, So, and these folks can contact you and say, hey, we'd like to help. Well, here I am, an economic empowerment ap uh, certified applicant, a year out, and I haven't heard anything about who has reached out to you and say, hey, I'd like to partner with an economic empowerment applicant. At no point were we ever called together to say, hey, this is what, this is, this is who you are. There's only about 120. This is who you are. This is, this is the opportunity that's before you. This is how we can help. I've heard you state in, cer in certain different ways that you are limited, but um, you guys are of the regulatory body. My background, I did policy work for the state of Massachusetts in the education department. We did policy work around equity. If you wanna have equity, you have to bring the people who have been most disenfranchised by the equity to speak and so that you can engage them in ways to understand, not just research, not just put out uh, a, a report, but engage them so that you can take action steps. While you sit here and say that your hands are tied in terms of what you can do, the understanding is that you were appointed by the governor and by the treasurer to be the ones to put out the regulations that will meet the requirement, will meet the, uh, the desires of the voters of Massachusetts to address those greatest impacted, not just the communities, but the individuals as well. Again, and so, if you wouldn't mind, please. Okay, sure. Thank you. And so with that, I ask that you look at who it is that you're calling to the table and how it is that you are engaging us. I'd like to hear more in terms of how it is that you're going to ensure that we get the information at least, if not the funding and the resources that we've talked about, that you, you've heard plenty of people talk about, if not that, at least the information so that we can move forward in this industry in a, in a, in a successful manner. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, next, but thank you very much. Can I just ask, when, w when, if anything, will you be following up with yeah. EEs? I mentioned at the beginning that there would be both an FAQ of the yeah. session. And I mentioned that there would be an FAQ of the session sent out shortly, as well as we will follow up with uh, roundtables on specific topics, including some of the things that have been discussed today, including financing as one example. So we'll we'll follow up shortly, but there'll be an FAQ with all, 
the topics that we talked about today as well as next steps, and that will be shortly. We've got, we've got staff here transcribing, and so we'll try to turn it around as quick as possible. We are also starting a regulatory process in February, um, and all the input that we're receiving today will be absolutely part of that regulatory process. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is uh, Jillian Williamson, and after Jillian will be uh, Peter DeCaro. So is I, I'm sorry? Okay, thank you. Uh, next speaker is Peter DeCaro, and uh, after Peter will be uh, Kimberly uh, Murphy. Uh, Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Appreciate you taking the time to hear, uh, hear our stories today. Um, I'd like to direct my focus to three main areas. While I share many of the sentiments of, of my peers here in the room, I think that there are three areas that we would like to address that we think could lead to some immediate reform and some satisfaction in getting through this process. Um, specifically, I'd like to address the priority status. I'd like to address the medicinal use um, licensing fees, and I'd like to discuss the final licensing process. So unlike many of my peers, I'm kind of the grandfather in this room. I've been doing this since 2016. We received our provisional certificate for medicinal use in November of 2016, and we received our, we went through our FCR inspections for medicinal use on uh, October 31st and November 5th of this year for our cultivation site and retail site, respectively. Throughout this process, we've gone through many of the same issues. The challenge of raising capital. Uh, when I jumped into this business uh, as founder and CEO, I, I didn't have an economic empowerment program, so we kind of forced through this and trudged through this the hard way. Throughout this process, in all of our medicinal use submissions and adult use application submissions, we encountered one problem, which was a change of control issue that we addressed within 24 hours to the commission. Our paperwork has been in full. We've, we've hosted job fairs, we've, we've attended um, events and, and supported local charities. We've tried to operate just like a license holder in the absence of us having that final license. But the challenge that we have is, you know, once you're here and once you've passed this FCR process, obviously the, the, the public meeting agenda process has been a great challenge. We, we see l existing license holders coming through and getting their licenses prior to a company like us that has priority status, that's met every obligation, and now by the time, if, assuming that we could get on to the next agenda, we're waiting 90 days from that original inspection. I propose one change, which would be of, of the public meeting agendas, can we move towards a, a process where new applicants are heard as a priority and perhaps the provisional applicants are heard in a private forum or perhaps uh, at a greater level of frequency so that doesn't take away from the time needed to push applica you know, applicants like us that are at the finish line through. And I think that would be a process that would benefit everybody uh, that is, is able to get to that final step. The second thing is in regarding the medicinal licensing fees. As I pointed out, we've been doing this for three years. We've paid our $50,000 fee every year annually. Uh, as you can imagine, in addition to revenues that we need to pay uh, as advances against sales revenue with various municipalities as a result of HCAs, you know, th there's a huge cash flow crunch um, that we're all under. I mean, whether regardless of what your application status is. So for me, I'd like to talk about, you know, how can we... 30 seconds, please. Well, thank you. You know, is there a way to reduce that burden throughout this process um, where perhaps it can be deferred or it can be rolled into the, the final, you know, process and, and as a fee at the end? Because, again, it's a huge cash flow crunch. And we're really at the mercy of your process in order to, to be able to open. And lastly, just the priority status is the third thing, is how do we get better transparency? What does that mean to us? I'd like just to get a better, better transparency, ver better visibility into that process. Thank you, Peter. Are there questions? Yes, uh, Commissioner, uh, yes, Commissioner Kleiner. Yes. What do you mean by better transparency? Everything we do is in public. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> what, what does that mean for me as, as someone who has priority status? Is that going to be an indication that if we are to meet this certain deadline that we're going to have a certain delivery against this application process? Or does that mean that once our applications are in and accepted that we're going to be prioritized ahead of other applicant holders? I, I think that definition is a little bit unclear because if it is that we have priority status over other applicants, I look at those that are currently operating in the industry today and I'm saying, well, how is it if I have priority status and I've met the responsibility, how are we not being put ahead of, ex of existing operators? Okay. I just want to get clarity on that point. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so Appreciate much. It. Uh, next speaker is uh, Kimberly Murphy, and following Kimberly will be Ken Shattuck. Kimberly? Hi. 
I said Kimberly Murphy and then Tim Shattuck. So, okay, that's, thank you for that. So you are Kimberly Murphy. I am. Nice to meet you. I don't like speaking, so <laughs> I apologize if my voice shakes. I'm from HECA Incorporated. We are an RMD priority applicant, and I'm honored to be here today with all of you. I will be very brief. I just want to commend all of you for your outstanding job that you're doing. I know it's extremely, I know it's extremely hard to take over a business from DPH to CCC, and I want to commend all of you on all of your hard work. I re we really do appreciate it. I, I, I guess I have to <laughs> ask for no applause on that as well. Um, n there's numerous. To be fair, <laughs> but go ahead. There's numerous applications, economic empowerment, RMD priority status, general applicants, um, and you're doing an outstanding job. Our company has traveled countrywide on our own expense. Um, and the Massachusetts regulations we've heard from everyone is what other states look for for guidance. So I want to commend you on that. So excellent job. Thank you. And I'll see you in the future. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Kimberly. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Matthew Yi, and following Matthew will be Tim Teo. OK, thank you, Matthew. Tim Teo is the next speaker, followed by Flavia, uh, Flavia Hungaro. So, uh, Tim Teo. Afternoon, how are you? Good, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Thank Appreciate you, you asking. <laughs> Tim Keo, uh, I'm here. Close to the microphone. Here speaking on behalf of Basque, which is uh, RMD 445. Uh, I got involved in the cannabis industry back in 2012 um, as a medical cannabis advocate. Um, coordinated an application in the, the early rounds um, and, you know, have secured a, uh, an MTC in Fairhaven, so down on the south coast, uh, which is not the south shore, that's a plaza. Uh, south coast is a stretch of uh, Massachusetts that runs from Wareham over to Fall River. Uh, grew up there, we've been from there, um, so been doing this a long time. Uh, the, the cannabis industry is difficult. I mean, everything about it is difficult. My job is difficult. Your jobs are difficult. Um, that's the challenge that we've accepted, um, to pursue opportunity in this industry, um, to regulate this industry. Uh, so I have a pretty good understanding of you know, the challenges that you guys face and wanted to take this opportunity to talk about some of the challenges that we face uh, as entrepreneurs and operators. So you know, we're held to a, a very high standard for uh, accountability and transparency. Um, you know, that's largely based due to the federal illegality and the risks associated with the industry. So the federal illegality, the lack of track record for the cannabis industry, um, the local fear mongering and nimbyism um, to develop uh, support from our local officials um, and ever changing regulations. So, you know, there are other factors, but those are really the big ones. So we're held accountable by a number of individuals. So whether they be uh, the CCC, uh, the staff, the regulations, uh, but also our employees, uh, our patients, uh, the elected officials, the public safety officials and the communities where we operate, uh, and our future employees, so adult use consumers, uh, and the environment. So this is not a normal set of business circumstances. It's, it's difficult, it's challenging. Um, we're doing what hasn't been done, and that's, that's a collectively as the industry and as the regulators. Um, and a lot of times, I don't have all the answers. Uh, when our stakeholders call um, and want, you know, updates or uh, status uh, situations for where we're at with a particular project or a particular position or job, um, but we answer the call. We respond to the text messages, the pop-in meetings. We're held accountable. Um, and, and the frustration that I think uh, a lot of operators and I think applicants are starting to feel is um, that there's a lack of accountability on the CCC's part to respond to our needs as, as business people. Um, so, you know, I think a couple of things that could help, uh, you know, having been involved not just in the application process, but you know, through the inspection process, you know, we've got a permitted, uh, approved, 30 seconds, please. constructed facility that's been got a certificate of occupancy in August. We got the approval from the commission in October to move our existing grow into it, uh, and we're, we're driving up to an empty parking lot every day. So 
um, you know, putting in some systems and processes to make the inspection process more efficient, make the regulator's jobs easier so that you can do more things with less people, um, I think is something that you really should look at. So whether that's a project management software, uh, an ERP, something to speed up that process would be a, a, a big benefit to all of us in the whole process. So thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, next speaker is uh, Flavia Higaro, and following Flavia will be John Moore. Good afternoon. Hello, thank you very much for being here. Oh, I think you just need to be very close to the microphone, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. My name is Flavia Hungaro. I am the majority owner of LMCC LLC. Uh, this is a 51% minority owned and 100% female owned local cannabis startup company. I'm also a social ed equity uh, program participant. Thank you for the classes, they were very, very helpful, by the way. Um, I would like to thank the Cannabis Control Commission for the amazing opportunity provided uh, and also commend you on your hard work in implementing uh, equitable cannabis licensing. At this time, I am anxiously awaiting one of my legal applications to be deemed complete for a proposed dispensary in the city of Taunton, Massachusetts, which has been labeled as a disproportionate area uh, impact area. Taunton is a city which has given 10 HCAs uh, for retail, although only five local licenses will be awarded and no equity ordinances uh, have been um, enacted. In addition, the owner of the property that I have uh, contracted with has negotiated uh, a sale for the land with Jim Company at the expiration of our contract. My contract can only be extended if my company is awarded a provisional license from the CCC by the end of March. I have uh, responded to my RFIs with professional assistance uh, and deeming uh, my application complete now is a chance for the CCC to make a real positive impact in a disproportionate impact community. Thank you for your uh, continued efforts and I look forward to hearing that the first retail application for the female minority and social equity program participant owned company LMCC LLC has been deemed complete. Thank, Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Flavia. Any questions for uh, Flavia, Commissioner Title? Just to clarify, um, you mentioned that uh, your lease would be canceled if you didn't receive a provisional license by a certain date? Right, we have until April. Is that a city requirement or a? No, this is uh, a memorandum of understanding with the owner, the property uh, uh, owner. Okay. And um, so we have until March, uh, April. So after that, he says that if we can, you know, get to a final decision, uh, you know, more clearly, then he can work with me. Otherwise, um, it, he has other, you know, prospects as well. Okay. But he's been very helpful so far, and I've submitted my RFIs back. So I'm hoping that that will be enough time for you know the commission to review, and we can get into a, a final decision. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Flavia. Thank you. Uh, the uh, next speaker is John Moore, and the speaker afterwards is Nicholas Mortolaro. John. We will uh, come back to John. Um, Nicholas Mortolaro, is he here? Nicholas, and then the speaker after Nicholas will be uh, Louis Andrew Muddy. Good afternoon, Nicholas. Good afternoon, commissioners, and uh, thank you for taking the time today. McBride, Title, Hoffman, uh, Doyle, and Flanagan. Uh, you guys are the leaders of cannabis in this country, and I appreciate that you are looking for our feedback in order to create a more equitable uh, market here in Massachusetts. So to that end, uh, I'm here, Nicholas Mortolaro. I'm a chemical engineer, a Salvadoran American, uh, a partner in a minority owned. Yeah, it's really close to the microphone. Here. Yeah, a uh, partner in a minority owned cannabis company here in Massachusetts, seeking uh, cultivation, manufacturing, and retail licenses. Uh, partners on our team are part of the social equity program. We do abide by the SBO's uh, minority business enterprise uh, criteria. Uh, so we are seeking to launch a company uh, with that expedited review. Um, this is a great program, uh, but after some feedback with our investors, there are some points I'd like to go through, uh, points of uncertainty that create an additional barrier for entry for investors to come into our company and help it to succeed. 
So the main question kind of revolves around the 51% or more ownership requirement of these licenses. Um, one of the main questions there being to what extent and at what time may that 51% be diluted? You guys know there's uh, very restricted access to uh, financing, debt financing by banks. Equity raises are one of the only ways to grow a business. Uh, it becomes very difficult to secure financing if uh, investors aren't sure, you know, they can get their part for the money they're providing for us to succeed. Bless you. Um, so we are looking for certainty and guidance from the commission around a timeline that we're able to dilute and to what extent we're able to dilute and still meet the criteria of the program. Um, along that similar line, uh, we're wondering to what point and at what extent uh, we can sell or exit upon the license, uh, as ownership uh, really doesn't mean much if you can't uh, sell it and you know profit from it uh, at a later date. Um, we've also had some questions around uh, restricted shares seconds, please, Nicky. or the ability to um, have a pool of equity that is reserved for future hires that meet the criteria uh, of our program um, in order to incentivize talent that meets the requirement to join our team. Right. Uh, not necessarily ascribing all that 51% or more equity uh, from the onset. Um, so, you know, looking at uh, whether that pool uh, is available. Um, finally, I'd like to ask, we, we are uh, an academic institution. A lot of our partners come from academia, our researchers. We'd like to pursue the vertically integrated medical opportunity, um, but it is prohibitively expensive at that 50,000 mark. So we're wondering if there's any possibility for consideration for minority-owned businesses social equity businesses, economic empowerment businesses that want to go that extra mile and serve uh, patients in the state of Massachusetts to have some part of that um, be waived. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Are, 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 there, are there questions? Thank you very much, Nicholas. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Um, the, uh, the next uh, speaker is Lewis Andrew Muddy, followed by Matthew, Matthew Leader. How are you guys? Good, Lewis. Nice to see you. <coughs> You've heard, you, since you're in the front row, you've heard. Please uh, be very close to the microphone for when you're speaking. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, good enough. Thank you. Is that good? Do you want me to hold it? <coughs> this might work. Um, anyways, thank you for having us, and thank you for the listening session. I'm a micro business applicant. My, ap my uh, application number is 281535. I'm also a social equity applicant. My number is 304150. It kind of sounds like prison numbers right now because I, I'm afraid that that's where I feel like I am. Um, my application's been sitting on the commission's desk for 351 days. My application has been in review for 300, uh, sorry, for 133 days. Uh, the application process is, is my biggest hurdle to trying to figure out how to get my business off the ground and get it up and running. Um, a couple of uh, people here and other people have touched on the fact that we need some staff members associated with apps specifically. What's happened to my app, which has also happened to others, is the fact that one person will read it, the next person will interpret it differently, the next person will see that because person A didn't catch up on the timeline, my some of my documents are now expired. So I don't have a huge law firm supporting me. We're all small businesses trying to make this work. So we do things in steps. You know, we take time off of work to do them. I, if my paperwork is out of date, it's just a, a problem with the process. So the way I see it is we have RMBs that have priority and everybody else that has secondary priority is this. And that's where they sit until you go through these. But I've suggested it before, if you take one employee and have them just review them, that's not against the law. And then EEs can have a look at it. And then social equity can have a look at it. And then micro businesses can have a look. And that's where really priority can start to flow. The other problem that happens is I'm through three RFIs and I'm sitting over here like this, hoping to get to the top of the list. And the more RMBs that come in, the more I get pushed to the bottom. And that's really frustrating for somebody that's spending $5,000 a month on rent. You know, I've spent 135000 just on rent to keep this business alive right now. And it's going to be more because obviously we have 90 days. But why 90 days? You know, 
if I murdered someone tomorrow, you could have my background check done overnight. You know what I mean? So that's a problem. So a suggestion, and what we may be able to do is, you know, RMDs get their own person. Let them review them. If not against the law, let them, you know, file through the system like they've been. But everybody else should also have priority based upon, A, how many RFIs they've been through and how close they are to licensing. The more we get up and running, the more these businesses get up and moving, it makes you guys think better. It makes the whole industry thrive better. It'll bring prices down. It'll make people have the ability to be able to afford product. I last heard that a pound of weed on the legal market was sold at five grand. So you know, thirty, 30 seconds, so please. So we're back. We're back to that. So transparency. You ask how you can do it. Let's see a running list because we're not transparent when we have all these applicants in queue, but nobody knows where they are or how they're sitting there. So that's not very transparent. The system should be like, oh, I can log in. Oh, I'm three days behind the next reviewer. But unfortunately, I'm going to see the RMDs come back in and sit on top of me. So how do we prioritize priority, really make priority a priority, and not EEs a secondary, social economic, uh, equ equity a third, and micro businesses a fourth? I Thank think you. there's a way to do it, and I think we just got to filter it in. It's kind of like shuffling cards. Thank you. Or, thank you. Appreciate it. Are there questions or comments? Oh, thank you, Lewis. Thank you. Please. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker is uh, ne next speaker is Matthew Leader. Is Matthew here? And the speaker after Matthew is Seth Wakeman. Matthew, how are you? Next speaker, as I mentioned, is Seth Wakeman. All right, got three minutes. So, July 29th, I purchased the property. Well, not purchased, but signed off on the property. Yeah, yeah, you're a little closer to the microphone. You apologize. July 29th, I signed off on my property as a... Uh, sorry, would you mind uh, just for distraction, would you mind starting again? I, 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 I won't charge you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Your three minutes will start now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Matt Leader, part of Hemp Holistics LLC, small business, MBN 281-425. Uh, signed off on all my, uh, my property, my paperwork around July 29th. In October, we got everything registered with the state see here got our HCA done around May of 2019 had our second community outreach meeting because we had to delay our HCA let's see here we submitted all of our paperwork by the mid of May and unfortunately with that nothing's really happened yet with the business but what I'm finding is we're coming into a what I like to call a provisional uh, pre provisional loop where we go and we pay each month for our property. However, we get stuck along the lines. One of the areas that I'm stuck in right now is I wanna go and take, I don't know, 10, maybe 15% of my proceeds and, 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 and give that away to, to veterans, nonprofit veteran groups, nonprofit LGBTQ communities, things like that. Unfortunately, they've come back and they said, because under the new guidelines, you have to actually go and have uh, uh, an acceptance letter written off by all of these nonprofits. However, it's very difficult because with that, they generally don't go and accept profits from the cannabis company. So I was uh, I was let I was no uh, I was uh, told that unfortunately for the next three months, uh, I wouldn't be able to go and get an acceptance letter by one of the nonprofits. Uh, another nonprofit outright denied me. Uh, another nonprofit, we're in the talks, so hoping. Um, and that's actually the last thing on my RFI list. But just to kind of go and give you a little example, I know uh, Andrew had said something about it, but since submitting, uh, I spent over $19,000 on my property. Um, and since, uh, you know, obviously going in and writing off on the property or signing off on the property, spent $43,000. Um, I've written every single word in my packets. Nothing's come from a lawyer. Nothing's come from consultants. It's just been me. Um, I'm the sole proprietor. I don't have anyone else. Thank you. Um, but with that, I do want to go and hire a, a veteran, and that's why I want to go and donate to these groups. However, with that, it's going to be one of those deals. It's going to be another couple of months. I'm going to have to go and redo my IRS paperwork. I'm going to have to go and, unfortunately, 
wait a couple more months uh, to go and have that, uh, you know, obviously have something come back from your group as well. So that's kind of where we're at right now in terms of hemp holistics. And I kind of have a feeling that in terms of that, most of the other small businesses are in that provisional or pre-provisional loop. And we're just spending money and nothing's happening. Thank you, thank you, Matthew. Are, are there uh, questions for Matt, uh, com Commissioner Tuttle? Um, I'm just trying to clarify to understand. Sure. Um, so, uh, you didn't get the letter from the nonprofit to accept your donation. Yeah. Um, and you had listed in your plan that you would make that donation. Yeah, exactly. And 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 yeah, you know, the CCC wants the acceptance letter. So I reached out to the the nonprofit, and they said, "Okay, we'll contact you back." A month later, contact me back. And they said, nope, we can't accept it. And then another one is saying, well, we need to rewrite all of our bylaws, and that will take about three to four months. I'm sorry, what's the connection between the, is the rewriting the bylaws a separate issue from the donation? No, it's the same issue because the nonprofit doesn't have anything in there that states that they'll accept money from, from cannabis oh, companies. the nonprofit said they had to rewrite Yep, the exactly. So um, I'm just trying to understand this because it, it seems like a, Seems like it shouldn't be holding you up. There should be a way around it. I agree. Have <laughs> you tried to, but, but it is, of course, a requirement with a it positive is. impact plan to Absolutely. have yep. donations being accepted. Mm -hmm. um, so have you tried to um, have a different company that you could donate to or have a different element of your plan that's similar? We're, yeah, I'm trying to go in and, and think of other ways of doing this. The issue is, is that, I, like personally, I want to go and make sure that all of my employees are fairly represented, because um, I'm thinking of going in and hiring. Well, already thinking of hiring one employee that's a veteran, another employee that's part of the LGBTQ community. Um, so I want to go and fairly represent them, and obviously, you know, give donations to those groups as well. Um, so it's it kind of it's <laughs> no offense, it just sucks that I would have to go and retract that part of my plan to just get ahead, that's not right. I'm just trying to understand, like what, are you asking for us to do something? Not at all, I'm just going and expressing what we're, what's happening on our side of the fence. Okay. That's really what it is. Okay. I'll take care of everything, don't worry about it. I, I'm usually not a, a complainer or a bitcher. No, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm, no, that's the whole point of the form is to understand exactly, these issues. Exactly, exactly. But I was just wondering if there's something that we could do that would be more helpful after you've run into that problem. The only thing that I can think of off the top of my head is to make sure that in terms of uh, pre-provisional, you know, the loop that I'm talking about, and I think that's kind of one of the main issues right now is that if we were to be able to have some sort of uh, provisional license given out, obviously, you know, it, it, you need to go and have everything accepted to go and get the provisional license now. But if we were to have some sort of provisional license handed out while we can go and build our company and, and get it up and running, while we go and talk back and forth with the CCC, I think that would be a fairly efficient. I, I feel as though right now that the process is extremely inefficient. I try to be a very efficient person with everything that I do, and I see this roadblock happening, and it's kind of, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Matt. Thank uh, you. Uh, next speaker is Seth Wakeman, and the speaker after Seth is Devonta Davis. Is Seth here? Uh, Seth, Treason, Seth Wakeman, Treason, Patty. Devonta Davis would be the next speaker, followed by Morris Parquet. Is Devonta here? Please uh, just identify, have a seat, identify yourself. And you have three minutes, so thank you very much for coming today. Matt Joffrey, I'm actually a social equity applicant also. Um, Good afternoon. I'm here to talk about you delivery. Closer to the microphone, please. I'm, really I'm here to talk about delivery. Um, to what extent can ownership be shared between retail and delivery? <coughs> if delivery licenses are being reserved for SE and EE, if you could please clarify. <coughs> and according to 500.05010A, a uh, delivery licensee shall not have retail location accessible to the public. Does this mean that there can be no shared owners between retail and delivery? And what about less than 10%? or if an investor has invested in, uh, in a retail location. Okay. So, promise your response. <laughs> Can you send that in written as well? Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll absolutely get a uh, response to you on that. Appreciate the questions. Um, next speaker is uh, Morris Parquet, um, and then after uh, Morris will be Cleon Byron. So, Morris. Thank you, commissioners. 
So I, I brought a nice little visual here and I'll explain this. My name is Morris Partee, I'm social equity applicant, SCA 304495. And my purpose in this poster here is to explain what the commission has sort of inadvertently done. I'll be happy to show this to everyone else. Here. Just a couple, couple dates. So I, I follow Commissioner Title and thank you for, for announcing the excellent new social equity benefits based on your previous listening session. So that's fabulous. So that was four months and 10 days ago. So immediately upon hearing that, I applied because I qualify. Hey, this is great. And you know, the education and training, which I understand is full, I get that. The two new license types, and then the other two benefits, which I sort of accidentally stumbled upon, was the waiver, reduced fees, and what I'm really most excited about is the expedited application review. But what, and, and so when I applied, I got a fabulous message saying, thank you for your application submitted on September 13th. We'll review that and get back to you within a few weeks. So I was great, a few weeks, good. Unfortun unfortunately, I found out later in December that the commission had entirely stopped reviewing new social equity applicants as of six months ago. So you can understand why there's some frustration in the group in that you've promised expedited review, but how can you get expedited review if the application is not even reviewed? So I, I, so I got an email in December saying the commission has stopped reviewing Social equity. Now I understand why, because at the time you only had the education component and that's all full and these aren't really open yet. So, but I would love to get, so my company paid the full fees, but I think I would qualify to have them waived. So, so I just want to point out, point. I would love it if you actually reviewed social equity applications once again so that people like me who qualify. So I'm speaking on behalf of all social equity applicants who qualify who have not previously been accepted into the program. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, are there comments or questions? Uh, thank you very much, we really appreciate that, Morris. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is, uh, is Cle Cleon Byron. Thank you. And uh, after, uh, after Cleon is uh, Jerry uh, Gadera. Uh, Cleon? Good afternoon, how are you? Nice to meet you, nice everyone. Uh, again, uh, please uh, make sure you're close to the microphone. I, I'm also gonna keep it short and sweet. Um, everyone here has expressed probably all the feelings that I have. Um, just like, you know, we've been waiting for a long time, you know, just like everybody else with the social equity getting approved. You know, it's first cohort, second cohort. And, um, you know, we're waiting, we're spending money. Um, we're not getting any of it back. Um, and it's becoming exhausting, you know, and we, we're in limbo, you know, so we've created a place where all of us are in limbo we're trying to figure out how we're going to get out. And we're coming to you guys to figure out what our exit strategy is. And we don't know what it is. And, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities out there because we're holding back on these provisional license and all this that we're missing out on today and every day that goes on from now. And until we get this straightened out, you know, the same thing that you want to do is help us to become better, better entrepreneurs, you know, create more jobs for the community. You're stopping at the same time, you know, and, you know, you're putting us either in a hold by this going so slow. And uh, hopefully together we can figure out a solution to make this go further. All right. And then hopefully we can get some more notification on the second cohort to okay. find out when people can get in so we can get things started. Take care of that. Thank you. Uh, any questions for uh, Cleon? Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker is Jerry uh, Gadera, and uh, following Jerry will be uh, Frank McGuire. Is Jerry here? Good Hi there. How are you? How are you? Good. Uh, let me see. Can we see my camera here in a minute? Is this better? Uh, yeah, I can put it back. I can hear you. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Jerry Gadera. I have a, an independent testing lab application before you that I filed about this time last year. Um, I don't know how much you know about the, the testing labs, but we have a unique set of uh, difficulties, barriers to entry that uh, other applicant types don't, don't have. I won't um, bother you with a lot about the application process itself, uh, other than to note that it was mostly designed for um, retailers or cultivators. And so there were, throughout the application process okay, itself, the yeah, there were a lot of questions that uh, were clearly tailored for um, a different type of applicant. And I assume you can't set up a different application for all seven different categories, but it made it a little bit more complicated to go through that process for us. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to focus mostly on where uh, testing labs are right now. Um, you have uh, seven uh, total applicants before you. Two of them have been um, accepted. Uh, one of them has a uh, provisional conditional license and four more are still pending. Uh, I believe we were the first one that was still pending or among the top ones that were uh, filed about a year ago. Um, the, the labs um, that you have accepted so far, the two, um, were both previously medical testing labs and we're starting from scratch, you know, empty box, uh, buying our equipment and setting up our own team of scientists and, and people who can do it. And that's yet another hurdle to entry for us because uh, obviously as medical license applicants, they had already been through a, a similar process of the CCC even before when it was under the Department of Health. Um, and so uh, other than to say that we have that unique set of circumstances and barriers, that's really what I'm here to, to explain to you. Um, in our case, Analytics Labs, we're based in Holyoke. We'd be the only one, or the first one in Western Mass, uh, Western Mass, like so many other things in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's a little less attention than the rest of the state, um, but you've probably heard that before. Um, uh, but we'd be the first one in Holyoke. In Holyoke, there are already a number of uh, operations there. GTI is based in Holyoke as well. Um, and uh, we anticipate, especially as we see more outdoor cultivation, there's obviously more likely to be outdoor cultivation in uh, the Berkshires than there would be in um, north of Boston, for example. Um, and so we hope to be able to serve the people out there, and we think that it would uh, behoove the commission to prioritize our application uh, because it would be not only uh, a testing lab when you only have effectively a, a government-controlled, uh, created duopoly right now with only two labs, but we would be able to have uh, a service for the people in Western Mass, for the for the, our clients in Western Mass. So is that all? I uh, have 30 seconds. Okay. Oh, 30 seconds here. Well, the only other thing I would mention is that we are both minority owned and mostly female owned. Uh, I'm the COO um, and an investor in the operation. And that's that's our pitch. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate it. Any questions for Jerry? Uh, uh, Commissioner Tata? I, I believe independent testing labs and minority owned companies are already expedited. They are expedited. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. We're going through the certification process that the Commonwealth requires. So uh, we haven't quite finalized that. But apparently, you have to go. Do you have to go take a class or a course? Yeah. So that, um, if you look, are you familiar with the licensing guidance that was released at our last meeting? Uh, this is for everybody, not just you. So if you think that you would qualify for uh -huh. expedited status based on being minority owned or women owned or veteran owned, um, you can go to that guidance and it'll walk you through. We'll, we'll take a look. We've been working with a consultant who can help us with that too. Great. Great. Thanks. Good luck to you, Jerry. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is uh, Frank McGuire, and followed by Haskell Kennedy. Frank. Uh, please identify yourself when you sit down, but go ahead. Hi, my name is Ezra Parzibach. I'm speaking on behalf of Frank McGuire, who is an outdoor cultivation uh, applicant and uh, African-American. And he is having problems with his special permit process right now due to the data on water use uh, that have uh, that is in the guidance documents for uh, water use uh, at the CCC. Uh, and uh, we've reached out to uh, Commissioner Doyle. Thank you for uh, your time. Um, and we've also uh, had the report debunked uh, for use uh, with uh, the current uh, regulatory framework by the authors themselves. So just on behalf of Frank McGuire, we're requesting um, that uh, the data use on water usage, which I believe is uh, stipulated in the regulations, um, that uh, the CCC does have to collect uh, water use data. So if they can collect data from current growers and then that data on the website for water use could be updated 
Uh, currently, it says that each plant takes six gallons per uh, plant per day, uh, which most growers know is, uh, is quite a lot of water. Hmm. And we think it's inaccurate. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, to the, Mr. Gale. Just to, just an update on that. Sorry, you don't, you don't. She's not answering questions. She's just making yeah. a comment. So go ahead, and you can, um, you, you can get out of here. <laughs> yes, and I, I, I'm sure most people fall asleep when I start talking about energy and environmental issues. But um, I can't resist the opportunity to plug the fact that go for the, it. <laughs> the energy and environmental guidance will be coming out soon. That talks about. Um, the fact that we are going to be collecting exactly uh, the data requested and uh, that data will be made available. So obviously we need to collect it, we need to analyze it, we need to make it available for you and your um, representatives, analysts, et cetera, to look at as well. But it is information that we do plan to collect in part to help us, but also in part to help you plan your business models, and then look at what is needed in terms of water for grows these days in Massachusetts. Thank you, Commissioner Gale. Uh, next speaker is uh, Haskell Kennedy, and the speaker afterwards is Dominique uh, uh, Schalzi. Is uh, Haskell here? Again, we'll, uh, I'm going to serve, we, we have uh, about another eight or so expedited applicants before we get to the general applicant pool. When we're done with the expedited applicants, I'll circle back on all the priority applicants that uh, were not uh, here when I called their name. So ha we'll circle back to Haskell. Is Dominique Schelzi, and the speaker after Dominique will be uh, Michael Brask. Is, is, Do is Dominique here? Hey, Dominique, how are you? You've been sitting in the audience, so you know. Close to the microphone, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dominic Schelzi. I'm with uh, Wellman Farms. We are a DBE uh, applicant. Um, I want to first start out by acknowledging that the uh, task of, of implementing this uh, industry and, and the regulations um, was a daunting task. And um, I give credit to uh, the commission and to the staff particularly for the efforts that have been undertaken to, uh, to do that. Um, and so my comments are with that in mind. Um, the, uh, the response from the commission has, has uh, evolved over time and, and by updating the regulations and by attempting to be responsive to the comments that you're hearing here today and others that you've heard um, I think that the, the process has been made better, and so mm -hmm. I, I will uh, acknowledge that. Um, I would like to speak specifically about what I, what I deem to be a functional inequity in the process. And by that I mean that the process, um, it is not in the inception of it, it is in the implementation of the process that it has become inequitable for a lot of the applicants that you're hearing from here today. Uh, and, and so uh, there have been great disparities in the application process. Granting priority uh, processing to RMDs um, was something that I think is, is quite problematic to this group of people. I acknowledge why it was done and that it, it has helped the industry to get off the ground more quickly, but I believe that its time has passed and there is no longer a, a functional reason for RMDs to be getting priority processing today. Um, you know, many of the RMDs that came in initially were processed very quickly. Um, it, it took us approximately 24 months to get to preliminary approval, um, 14 months in the actual application process with the CCC. Um, we were required to have a location that as many people have suggested to you here today, cost us a, a significant amount of our capital that we had earmarked to build out our facility and, and now are not in a position to do that and are having to figure out other ways to uh, raise capital. That's uh, 30 seconds, please. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Dominique. So, uh, so the requirements of, of diversity, um, um, There, there, were, there, were no, there was little guidance or, or, or not fully developed guidance in the original applications 
but guidance was developed over time. The functional effect, this is an example of how the, the functional inequity occurred. Um, we were required to come up with a diversity plan that was fundamentally different than the original requirements, and it, it ended up causing um, an RFI, in our case, that, that cost us additional months of time mm -hmm. in responding to it. And so one of the things that I would look for this commission to do is to look at the effect of the guidance that you're setting down and what requirements you're placing on applicants, particularly those applicants who were not RMD um, prioritized. Uh, uh, thanks, I need you to wind down, Dominique. It's Who's I need you to wind down, please. Yeah, no, I, I understand, I'm, I'll, I'll wrap up. I have. I have more to say, but I'll wrap up with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominique. Are there, are there any questions for Dominique? Could you send the rest by writing? I will. Sure. Okay. Thanks very much, Dominique. Appreciate it. Okay. Next speaker. Uh, next speaker. Uh, speaker is Michael uh, Grays. Uh, Gray. Uh, Silent S. Silent S. Yeah. Yes, French Canadian. Okay. <laughs> uh, All right. So uh, I think uh, a lot just of wait. Hold on a sec. One sec. Uh, and the speaker after uh, Michael will be uh, Mauer Springer. Go ahead, Michael. All right, I cut a little of this out in the interest of time. Um, in 2016, my wife and I were both educators. I was a special ed vocational specialist, and she was an elementary music teacher. We've both been lifelong cannabis enthusiasts behind closed doors. Our plans and the exciting promise of the legalized recreational industry attracted a dozen friends and acquaintances that provided modest amounts of investment to fund our startup. Like many of our peers, we saw a serious issue at the municipal level, so we focused on finding a cannabis-friendly community. In September 2018, we found our facility in Uxbridge. We invested in a costly six-month option to lease the property with three months, of, three months of continuations. Uxbridge was very accommodating, but still took almost four months to obtain the HCA and zoning approval. Uh, we signed for 1.75 on December 17, 2018. We spent four months writing our application. We wanted to leave absolutely no room for interpretation. We gave this the required summary of the SOPs as well as a section of regulatory compliance where we cited every applicable line item of the regulations and how we will remain compliant with those regulations. On top of both of those sections, we provided full appendices with our full step-by-step -step SOPs. We, sub we uh, submitted our, compl our completed application in July of 2019. We knew it was gonna be a long time for the review. August 2019 came along, our option ran out, we had to pick up the full lease. To date, we've paid $140,000 holding our property. That's almost five years teacher uh, salary as a teacher. We recognize the need for reviewers to request more information on an application, but our RFI we received in December was nothing short of absurd. The only substantive thing needed was more, descri more description of our edible, the size, shape, and flavor. The vast majority of the required up up updates were a direct result of how long it took review our application, signatures expired, timeline off. All uh, right. <sighs> One detail of our RFI continues to haunt me as we face the next stage of inspection. In our original application, our very detailed inventory auditing procedures included completed, complete weekly and quarterly inventory audits. We wanted to do more than what was required by the regulations. The review team flagged this part of our application and stated that we were not compliant with the monthly or yearly audit mandate. This is beyond insert and somewhat insulting. It's almost like the reviewers are looking for things to slow down businesses. Are these the type of thing, uh, demands that we'll be facing as we go through the next stage of the inspection? Uh, Almost two years have gone seconds, by please. nearly um, as we near uh, obtaining our provisional approval. Um, we hope to start making money by the end of the third year. By then, I think we will have earned the chance to, to begin living on normal wages and have the ability to reward the trust of investors who enabled us to survive. There are small businesses are the backbone of industry in Massachusetts. What have, or more importantly, what will the regulators do to help small businesses like ours become part of the recreational cannabis industry? There are hundreds of companies in similar positions. We're just asking for a chance to, to prove that we can run compliant and profitable businesses. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, any questions? Uh, any questions for Michael? Sorry, I'm sweating. No, uh, you did. did I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. People are feeling intimidated, but everybody, everybody that's coming up here is doing a great job, and we're learning. And, it's, and so, I really appreciate what you guys are yeah. doing. Thank you. Please, but please don't. You know. Any questions? No. Be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes. Oh, what? Okay. Thank you.
Yeah, we're, we're going to, uh, I think, go for another uh, seven minutes and take a short break at 3 o'clock. Awesome, we're done, awesome. Yeah, I think we're going to get to everybody. So awesome, yeah. awesome. So that does that mean I have seven minutes? I get uh, no, that doesn't minutes. mean, that means you have three minutes more. <laughs> well, I, I should, I should. But first, I want to specifically talk about the um, issue I've been having. Um, I, a lot of these processes and uh, words and how you guys term things and stuff, it goes over my head. So I filled out my application last year, uh, February. Um, I didn't receive any contact communication from you guys for about five months. Um, uh, it was an email that I got from you guys asking me to verify where I lived at, the residency. Um, I answered that, and then I, hit, I just recently heard something from you guys in December saying that um, I didn't start my application process until November. So, but I really started it in February. But um, so just pretty much me as a black man, I, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to uh, put anybody else down, but I'm speaking for myself. I need my hand held through this process. You know, um, it wasn't hard for me to get arrested for marijuana. They came right to my park when I was 14 and arrested me as an adult for marijuana. So they went looking for black kids, but to me it seems like white women have more priority than the black children who are currently being arrested for marijuana. They just arrested, they just gave a young boy 40 years, a teenager, 40 years for two scales and some weed. You know, and then people are crying about priority, and I get it. People should have priority, you know, for being marginalized in other areas. But black men definitely need priority here. And I'm speak I'm privileged, I'm here, I'm at the table, I'm speaking to you guys, so I'm a little privileged than a lot of other black men, but I gotta say it, because if I don't say it, it won't be said. And um, I think the lack of compassion for black men is reflective in what we have, and you guys, what I'm looking at right now. We have a lot of compassion for white women um, who are represented in industry at a greater number than black men and, and uh, Latino men, brown men. Um, but they're getting a lot of priority status because you guys have compassion for white women because there's white women up here. You know, so we need some black men and some black women up here because they will have compassion for black men. You know, they will have compassion for uh, uh, black women getting into this industry. And that's what we need, you know. We need people who understand. Um, uh, when, when a lot of policies are being, it's, it, I, quite frankly, it's a smack in the face. That's why I got to say it. I'm not trying to offend anybody or anything else like that. I got to say it because it's not going to be said if we don't say it that black men need some representation here. We were the ones affected by the war on drugs. And if you check Colorado, they're going to continue to arrest our black A S. We all are telling here ass. Mm. You understand me? So, uh, you know, they're going to continue to arrest us. They're going to continue to target us, not myself, because I put myself in this privileged position. But um, I'm having difficulty filling out this paperwork. I'm having difficulty making it through this process, and I need to make it through this process. Or I'm going to be arrested again. I've been being arrested since 14. I just had a, a secret indictment. I wrote a book about, I'm going to launch my book tonight about a secret indictment I had in Massachusetts in 2016. Um, it's going to be called, it's gonna be called Massachusetts Jumping Jim Crow for Cannabis. Okay. Massachusetts Jumping Jim Crow for Cannabis. Because okay. we got to talk about these black faces you know, um, in our position, my position, this is my position. You know, this was done for me, you know, and done to people who look like me. So I'm not scared to say that, and I gotta say it, because nobody else here gonna say it, you know. So thank you for your thank time, you man. You guys, did you have anything to say? Any Please? questions? So other than thank you, for your, thank you for your testimony. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. And thank you, because okay, they're not doing you. it anyplace else, so I don't want to beat you up. Thank you. Not, I, I, could you leave the microphone? Yeah, <laughs> they're not doing this in any other state. They're doing this in Massachusetts, so. Let's take full advantage of that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, We're gonna do one. Seven minutes, man. Where are you? I told no. You said you had seven minutes. I only gave you three, but thank thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, we're. <laughs> We're going to do one more speaker, and then we're going to take a 10-minute break. Um, so my next speaker is, is Kira Fernandez. Is she here? Kira? Yes, speaker. Okay. Hi, Kira. Uh, well, good afternoon. Again, close to the microphone, please. You can keep in the back and hear you. Even a little closer if you would. Closer, okay. Yeah. You got, you got to hunch your shoulders over and then lean in a little All bit. Right. Get in the groove here. Pull it to you. <laughs> or both. <laughs> Am I good now? Good. Yeah, it's, it's for the people <laughs> in the back. We can hear you, but uh, for the people in the back, go ahead. Okay. My name is Kyra Fernandez. I'm the owner of HTC Trinity LLC, HTC standing for Hometown Connection. I am a real estate broker, an accountant, wife, and mother of three. I am the homegrown entrepreneur from the city of Taunton where my roots run strong and deep. 
I am a social equity applicant and have submitted my retail marijuana application for state review. I am the second female minority applicant in the city of Taunton, of which has been identified as an area disproportionately impacted. I am the only lifelong resident in the city of Taunton in pursuit of a license. There are five to be given in my city. I was recently granted my special permit for my site located at 354 Winthrop Street in Taunton. This was a huge accomplishment in my pursuit for licensing. There were over 200 supporters either were present for my special permit hearing or they stopped by, they stopped by my office earlier in the day or stopped by the event, they didn't have time to stay but they signed a petition in support of myself and my location. I am committed to making a positive impact within my community through my retail marijuana business. My core values are youth engagement, education, civic responsibility, and the empowerment of women and other minorities disadvantaged by social or economic circumstances. My goal, my primary goal pretty much is to be the, the best asset to my community through this business endeavor. I am hoping to gain more insight on the timelines for state approval and benefits available to support me as a social equity applicant. Tensions, tensions are running high in my city. There's five licenses to give. I am the fifth special permit to be, to be given in the city. Like I said, it's a huge deal, it's a huge accomplishment, and I'm just hoping that my, my application can be processed swiftly and any benefits that I could be entitled to that I'm able to, to take full advantage of in the near future. Um, it's, let me see, I am, I'm the little fish in hoping to make a big splash. My passion is to create a positive footprint in my community, and as I said, the more information and guidance that I can have through the process is gonna help elevate me in, in the best way possible. I wanna thank the, the commission for, my, for the time to speak. Thank you, Kyra. Sorry, I mispronounced your name. It's, it's Kyra, not Kyra. Kyra. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Any questions for Kyra? Thank you. Uh, best of luck. Um, Thank you. Let's do one more, and then we'll take a break. Um, so the, the next speaker is uh, Keith uh, Bisogno. Good pronunciation. Did I get that right? That was awesome. Seriously, you were saying that. Thank right? you. I, I totally butchered it, right? No, Keith Bisogno. I'm representing an independent testing lab application, and I appreciate the time to speak. I'll actually limit my comments and ask to submit, if I can, comments and questions. Please do. We, and um, just not, let me just expand, not, not just for you, anybody that either spoke and had more to say and just the time didn't allow or people that chose not to speak today, we welcome and as a matter of fact, we request your comments um, so that we can incorporate them into our regulatory process as well as our thinking about process changes. So thank you, go Perfect. ahead. So uh, with regard to an independent testing lab, we haven't heard a lot about them and they're frankly not enough in this state and I think with the uh, cultivation and other manufacturing space coming online, the bottleneck will only grow. So the good news, is I'm um, with a team invested, experienced, and really uh, quite ready to move quickly to as fast as eight months. But we're trying to navigate and sequence through what in Massachusetts is a little different than what we've been able to navigate successfully in other states. And for the crux of the issue is the ISA certification as a prerequisite. And I'm wondering, I guess, two things. One, if there's rationale that sort of puts while ISA certification definitely puts a, uh, maybe limits some risk for the commission or puts a, a certification accreditation up front, um, it limits and prevents the lab through that uh, early stage, as I understand it, from having any experience actually touching the plant or analyzing cannabis. So it's almost like um, in other states where we found the provisional licensing and uh, through an incredible amount of rigor in that process. So it's not in any way an easy lift, but then having the six to eight to even 12 months in California, I believe, to earn the ISO accreditation really changes the investment thesis. And for my investors to kind of see fork in the road, is it Illinois, is it another state? How does the sequence? Six months of operating in a mock, let's say testing hops, wouldn't really get us any better to be a good testing lab for the state. So that's the one issue I'd like to address and I'll put it in my comments and okay. if we would love to uh, find a way to navigate this as fast as possible and add a testing lab into the ecosystem. Thank, thank you very much, appreciate it. No, I'm sorry, are there any questions before? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, I really appreciate um, people doing a really good job of staying 
at least close to the three minutes, uh, and as a result, we're, we're actually making good progress. I'm, I'm confident that we'll be able to get through all of the pre-registered speakers. Um, that being said, I, I, I need a break, and I'm not, I'm not going to speak for my other commissioners, but I need a break. Um, I've got 3.02. Um, uh, can we uh, reconvene at 3.15, please? Can I have just one second? I could have just one second. Um, I just wanted to like reflect real quick. I'll keep it really short. Okay, you you know what you're getting in the I, way of. I know, <laughs> I know, I know. That's why I'm doing it now. But I, this is supposed to be an engagement. I don't want to just listen. But I'll keep it very short. Um, so one is, I think a lot of people miss this. But when we announce this forum, we also announce that we are developing technology so that applicants can have more visibility into their status. That's really important on its own merits, but I also think, I'm also picking up that it's going to be important because there are a lot of myths as to how people see other applications being processed, um, and particularly the way that people are talking about RMDs. Um, I think it's really um, a myth that RMDs are priority slots that are being taken up and holding other people back, um, and I think when we have that vis visibility, I, I think that will help break down that myth. But also, I think the reason that we see a lot of companies move faster is because of systemic barriers. And obviously, the local process is a big part of that. Capital is a big part of that. But whatever those systemic barriers are that we can control, for me, that's the top purpose of this forum. And I've heard a lot of them so far, but I want to encourage you to um, keep noting those. And then the very last thing is, um, I'm not responding individually when people are saying um, experiences that they've had, particularly with our staff. Don't take the silence as um, agreeing with it. It's just it would be a waste of time, I think, and not productive to go back and forth. But there is one thing I really want to highlight, which is that a couple of people have brought up accommodations. Um, I want to make it very clear that if you need an accommodation, we have an email address, we have a phone number, we have a lot of ways to reach us to say, here's my disability, here's the accommodation that I need, and we will work to give you that accommodation. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Commissioner Pennell. Um, anything else before we take a break? Uh, it's now 3.05, so I'm going to say 3.20. Uh, we'll reconvene. Thank you. Um, does everybody know um, restrooms are out that way, plus there's several more down at the bottom of the stairs in the main part of the uh, station? <laughs>